and we're going to start what, we, what I'd like to call a cannabis speed dating, which is where I'm going to get you all on a table. We have a patient and a member of SBRG here, um, and they're going to stay static on each table. Basically, I'm going to put you on a table to begin with, and then after half an hour, 45 minutes, I'm going to say change, and you're all going to move to a different table. The person who is representing the patient's voice is going to tell their story, and then there'll be a Q&A, and then there's an opportunity for everyone to tell their story, because the really important thing about today is that everyone in this room is involved in cannabis in some way in Scotland. The whole point of us doing this today is to try and get you involved more in the cannabis environment. So in 2018, the law did change to enable uh, consultants to prescribe medicinal cannabis um, on the specialist registrar. Despite that, I'm sure many of you know, there have been almost none, uh, no prescriptions. I don't think any in Scotland, or at least none through the NHS. It was incredibly powerful uh, what happened in 2018, and we thought something would change. And it hasn't really. There's more to say on that topic, but I just wanted to introduce you to Lisa. So, Lisa, do you want to come up? As Anna said, I'm Lisa. Um, I am the parent of Cole Thompson, who is 10 at the moment and uses cannabis. This is Cole. He is a Cole was diagnosed with epilepsy at three months old. He was taking 20 seizures every night and some drop seizures during the day. 2018 Cole's seizures got incredibly worse and he lost the ability to walk and talk very quickly. He was in a wheelchair, unable to speak, couldn't eat solid food and was told that was it. Cole had brain surgery when he was two and a half. Um, unfortunately it didn't work. We got six months of him being seizure free and then the seizures came back. They said to me the only hope for Cole was a second surgery, but this time they would disconnect the left from the right side of his brain, which would leave Cole paralysed down one side and partially sighted forever. That was it. Um, I decided to take to social media to ask for help, and everything came back as cannabis. For 10 years, I was a police officer in Glasgow and had a very um, tunnel vision to what cannabis did. So when everyone mentioned cannabis, I said, absolutely not. I'm not giving my son cannabis. No way. I actually only decided to research it to prove everyone else wrong and me right. Um, and kept finding that actually I was wrong and everyone else was right. So I then decided to go to Holland. When I was in Holland, I got a prescription and smuggled it back into the country illegally. Mummy. As somebody who had never even had a parking ticket, <laughs> it was pretty bloody terrifying. Um, and I was risking, what, 14, 17 years in prison. And also because I was then giving it illegally to my child, um, came with extra. I flew home. Cole had been rushed into hospital, unresponsive, on the 22nd of March. And by the 26th of March, he was, his seizures had reduced by half. And then we gave him more, and they reduced by half again. And by the 11th of April, he was back running into school. He was then, at the end of April, back on his, his bike. Um, Cole now is completely seizure free. We've had maybe about six seizures in four years. Cole's private consultant doesn't believe that the seizures that Cole's had since he's been on cannabis are actually epileptic seizures. He takes another drug called Phenaton, the Delantin brand, which is a horrific drug, very toxic. But the NHS are refusing point blank to take him off it because they don't recognise cannabis as a medicine. Even though um, legally they can prescribe it, they don't recognise it. So the Delantin, believe it or not, one of the side effects is seizures. If it's too high or too low, it causes seizures. So the private consultant believes that actually the seizures that Cole's had aren't epileptic seizures, that they're probably because of the phenotone. He's fine. He's in mainstream education. He is at Taekwondo. He just graded a couple of months ago. He's very much um, like every other 10-year-old. Um, and now I've got my boy back. Despite this, despite knowing what's happened, Cole's consult consultant refuses to prescribe cannabis-based medicine. I know everyone's got a different story, but it's just to sort of understand where this anger is coming from and we all have it understand how much life can be shifted by this medicine and really to 
start to think about how we in this room can shift the narrative. Because one thing that we need to know and we need to remember is that cannabis medicine is the oldest medicine known to man. It was prescribed up until 1971 in Britain for over 100 different ailments. Some years ago, there was an archaeological dig at Sutra, which my mother actually took me to. And at that dig, they found cannabis in the soil. And it was the dig on a medieval monastery. And the medieval monastery had used cannabis, obviously, for something. And then there were two other digs in Fife, at the Black Loch and Kilconquhar Loch, where hemp and cannabis were found in the soil stratas. So we do have a lot of historical evidence for cannabis being used in Scotland in the medieval period and before and after. What I really want us to do is just change the narrative. Instead of this idea that somehow this is a new medicine and the rest of the world are kind of, you know, moving with the times and in Scotland we need to go with this new idea, we need to remember that this is our medicine. We use it, you know, many of us use it on a daily basis um, for well-being, for fun, for pleasure, for medicinal, for all sorts. But there are voices here that need to count and we need to feed in to the Scottish Government. I've lived with chronic pain since I was 13 years old after a horse riding accident. When I turned 18, I was on 3,500 milligrams cocodamol four times a day. And of course, that stuff wasn't starting to work and I was getting spasms, so they started adding diclofenic. And then that wasn't working, so they added baclofen, and then they added duloxetine, and then they added amitriptyline, and then it was noratriptyline, and then it was coming off the baclofen. Then it was on the ametrazil because that was all damaging my stomach and making me tired. The list was endless, right? I'd get up at 11 o'clock in the morning, two hours to get dressed. I would do class for two hours, and I'd have to go back to bed. I would see my peers going out to nightclubs, drinking, partying, walking into town, and I just had to stay at home, in bed, taking all these tablets. But when I found out that I had endometriosis, the first thing the doctor then said to me was, I'm really sorry, but you might not be able to have children. Now at this point, my childhood had been in and out of hospitals, getting operations, it had been painkillers. I was fighting so hard just to try a 15 hour course at college to do music. And then I was told that, I'm sorry, you might not be able to have kids. Like, like at this point, I was on 480 tablets a month. And I think that was probably one of the point that I kind of understood that I was depressed. And I didn't actually see the point in kind of continuing on anymore. Like, what is the point? I'm fighting so hard. I'm taking so many drugs just to manage a 15 hour a week lifestyle. It, it really did feel futile. It was that point in start of fourth year my friend kind of said to me, had you tried cannabis? Now, for a music student, I was still like quite prim, right? I didn't drink, you know, I would spend my money on Lord of the Rings and stuff like that instead of like going out drinking. So I was like, oh my gosh, I'm not gonna smoke cannabis. That's dangerous. You know, I was so against it. You know, I thought that what the doctors were giving me, they're giving me it for a reason. It's medical, it must be okay. So when I read into it and found the reasons why it was banned, it wasn't a medical, I was scunnered, eh? I was raging, I was so cross that it was being taken from people, not for medical reasons, you know, it, it was political reasons and so forth like that. So I tried it. I remember the first night I did it, I slept the whole night through without, without nor chipped in, without everything for the first time since I was like 13. So from, and I know this sounds unbelievable, I know it really does, right? But literally from that fourth year, right? I dropped all the medications and I was just on Cocodamol because I needed still pain relief and I couldn't guarantee cannabis all the time. So I needed that as a backup. I was at uni all the time. And I started my own music studio. I was working in community choirs and doing like work like that. I was, you know, doing musicals. I was actually out. I wasn't just fighting so hard just to maintain a little half-life. I was actually out consuming and enjoying bits of it. So that continued and you know, my piano student got really successful. I was a really great teacher. So I had this reputation, like I had to be so careful with to not ruin it because 
you know, if I, I got caught with cannabis, my PVG would be done. All my community work, all the dementia choirs, everything that I went out and did was at risk for me using this cannabis on, on the market that we had it. And there was a couple of times when I was at, a, you know, picking up from a deal in a car park and they would try to elicit like a sex favour from me instead of payment. You know, I was having to go to sit in car parks late at night, having to wait for a strange man to come drop stuff off. It was a re and I also had to balance not getting caught, not losing my entire reputation, all this work that I did for young ones and everything. It was all at risk until I found Project 2021, right? And I know this sounds so daft, but I found it on Reddit and I was like, no, no way, crap. There's no way that cannabis is legal in the UK, like medically. Surely I would have heard something by now. Because at this point I'd been smoking for a couple of years and I was just waiting for this legislation to come out. At that point I was working in a suicide crisis shelter for kids that I helped build up during the pandemic. And I was able to say to my employer, listen, I've now got the stuff that surgeons and doctors get in places like America and Australia, people with decision-making powers. This is what they use. This is what I'm using. And everything it was able to change from there. You know, I didn't feel like I had to hide myself. I wasn't putting anyone at risk. I wasn't risking my family who felt conflicted, seeing me in pain. My brother was, I don't want to see men take advantage of you. I don't want to see you get bothered. The difference it's made being able to access it legally has changed absolutely everything for me. I prescribe cannabis. Um, I, I'm a GP okay. and uh, I got interested in it a few years ago and I, I do prescribe but it is through a private clinic. I would love to see it becoming available on the NHS. I also work in drugs and alcohol and um, certainly for me it's safety profile of cannabis is fantastic compared to a lot of the things you prescribe. In Scotland we have a terrible drug deaths issue and I would love to be able to prescribe cannabis rather than diazepam and it's possible that in the future we might even be able to use medicinal cannabis in the addictions field, um, like stopping drinking. I, I've got Mike at this table because Mike helped me to get my first prescription and helped to get me legal, uh, which was really important. I'm a recovering alcoholic. I, I now haven't had a drink for about 11 or 12 years. For the first four or five years, I managed through consistent AA, going two to three times a week, but it didn't help me sleep. It didn't help with my anxiety. All it did was help me not to drink. And then I was out one night at a, at a party with a friend and he brought out some cannabis and I took some and I had an amazing night's sleep and I managed to stop my head because my, my problem is I can't turn my head off. I, I can't stop at night my head motoring uh, and, which, and believe me, it becomes deliberating because you don't sleep. And if you don't sleep, then you don't have a life, really. And Mike helped me to go and see the right clinicians. Uh, in the beginning, it was the medical cannabis clinics, who then, so I moved from, because I wasn't overly happy with their dispensary, uh, to uh, Mar Medica. But I gained a prescription. I take about 60 grams a month. I get a combination of low THC, sativas and, and higher THC indicas that I can take during the day. Uh, my doctor advises me to take them as and when I need them, not on a not on a fit a set routine. So I mean I haven't taken any cannabis today. I haven't felt the need. I haven't felt an anxious about an ink or uh, upset about an ink or and and I was coming here, which I was really looking forward to, which is all well, helps. Cannabis for me helps me to A, stop drinking and B, give me the quality of life, which I think everyone deserves, but it helps me to have. Uh, and that's why I, I do believe that many, many other people deserve the, the chance to have access to, to cannabis. It needs to be controlled, it needs to be regulated, because I need to be sure about what I'm getting. We don't have the structure um, around it in, in the country to, to really regulate it, give people access to ever get to the point where the NHS might fund it. Um, you know, as a cost of a medicine for a month, it's probably a lot less than most other medicines that are dispensed every day from routine pharmacists. But we work in a very traditional medical model. The training is the bad stigma. Good. 
just and absolutely and stigma. Uh, yes. Yeah. 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 Well, yeah. Not that uh, in medical school, there's absolutely no teachings about the endocannabinoid system. You want them to carry on taking the medication they're being given, but it's not actually helping them. But the cannabis does. And that's where they're coming from. It's not where I'm coming from because it's my job to tell them to take their medication. So I do tell them to take their medication, but as I say, the cannabis will help them a lot more. I'm a, a neurologist, or was. Uh, I'm now a cannabis physician, I suppose. It's an odd, odd end to a career, really. Um, and I was involved for a long time, about 20 years ago, with GW Pharma when they developed what turned out to be the first cannabis medicine called Sativex. Um, then nothing happened for about a decade because it wasn't widely used. Uh, then I was asked to do a report for the party parliamentary group on drug policy reform, which I, I think helped, didn't change the law, but it helped develop the, the discussion about it again. And then I was involved with Hannah Deacon, whose son Alfie Dingley got the first prescription. Uh, for anybody in the UK. I'm not a, a, a cannabis user, really. I don't use it very often. Um, but when I do, um, the experience is... Uh, it w well, it was so profoundly life-changing. I had a rush of empathy that I just didn't have before. I had a, a just an influx of being able to maybe just relate to people that I didn't have before. I, I, my life's completely different now. It's completely better now. And it was because of that. It was because of cannabis. What you said really resonates, that switch, that flip that happened. Because there's a moment that I remember specifically where I used cannabis in a scenario where I grew up with a very busy mind and lots of guilt trips. I was in a Catholic school and all this heaviness was with me. And I meditated. I was learning to meditate and learning to do yoga. And um, I decided to use cannabis to meditate one day. And I had this huge moment where like, all the thoughts that I'd ever thought about myself in a negative way were all contained in one circle. And with the looseness that the weed had given me, I was able to just like let that go. And something in me just went Phew. It was the most powerful feeling I'd ever had. What I found interesting about Malta was um, Malta legalized medical cannabis just before the UK did, around the same, the same year, just before, early in the same year. Per capita, they have 10 times more prescriptions, patient prescriptions than the UK. So in the UK, we're, we're saying that patient uptake is slow, and saying that awareness is needed to get more patients on board. Malta per capita has 10 times more patients and has decided to legalize non-profit adult use social clubs as a way to optimize the patient experience, not just for the recreational access, but because patients saying their needs were not being properly accommodated. I'm highly active in trying to get a wider range of medical cannabis available on the NHS here in Scotland and in the United Kingdom. Unfortunately, because of the 1971 Misuse of Drugs Act, it's in a category whereby research has been very limited for over 50 years. We made it very difficult for the medical profession to access this hemp plant and have it in their laboratories legally and to use it and to test it. And because of that, there's very little research here in the United Kingdom. So we tend to also not be very good at looking abroad. So we want to do it all over again and reinvent the wheel in the United Kingdom, but we're very slow at getting to that stage where we're allowing people access to the plant to do all the medical research, which will keep people happy. Because I understand, you can't just say, I've got a new medicine, let's put it in the marketplace. There has to be ethics, there has to be test made. I get all that, but we're just incredibly slow at it. And I think we should be able to speed up that process given the knowledge we should be gleaning from other countries. I think Scotland has a unique opportunity in that there is the opportunity to have this discourse with patients, with patient groups who, you know, are, are really the biggest stakeholders in all of this, and to ensure that we model a system that works for them. Because if the model doesn't work for the patients, who the hell is it for, right? And governments can't afford to make that model for pharmaceutical companies so that the money is extracted from the public purse, from the taxes that we all pay to prop up billionaires. We actually need a model where the, the stakeholder who is the patient and the GP at the forefront actually get to have the majority say in what goes on. So allowing GPs to prescribe would be a major, major improvement and to allow those consults to be NHS subsidised. And then as that happens, to be able to allow the 
the products themselves to be partially or fully subsidised. In Australia, many of the consults are subsidised, but not the product. But the large numbers of prescriptions and the large number of products means the price has come down enormously in the last few years. 300,000 odd scripts have been written. You know, if we could say that something like that could happen in Scotland, we would, we should see a reduction in the public spending on other treatments because cannabis can do a lot for patients who are currently spending a lot of money or the government is spending a lot of money treating them with lots of products that actually don't do the job. I do have something that I really need to talk to you about. And that is to do with the Scottish Cannabis Consortium and how we're actually going to affect policy change. Because we're here in this room together, we've all connected, it's been wonderful, the energy's been bubbling and flowing, but we're going to leave, and where's that energy going to go? You know, and I really I want, to, I want to present you with a couple of options. Some of them are doable, some of them aren't. Our vision is to use the SCC as a way of enacting policy change by using the knowledge and experience and expertise of everyone who engages in, the, in this group. And this can happen by two ways. So basically in Scotland, as you probably know, cannabis is not, re is not, con um, is not legal. It's controlled by the UK. Um, we have a weird legal situation where if you have a prescription, it's a Schedule B, which means it's medicinal. If you don't have a prescription, it's a Schedule 1, which means it's got no health benefits whatsoever. It's amazing. It's like fucking alchemy in action. It changes from harmful to non-harmful, <laughs> depending on the context. The idea is I want to get working groups in the SCC. And there are two avenues that we can affect immediate or at least quite quick change. One is through the Health Improvement Scotland. Health is a devolved matter, and it's governed by Health Improvement Scotland. We have two um, institutions within Health Improvement Scotland that are really important for the cannabis. One is SIGN, Scottish Intercollegiate Guidance Network, and SMC, the Scottish Medicines Consortium. Point is, these are the ones that provide the guidance on prescribing. At the moment, clinicians in Scotland are using NICE guidance. But as Lisa and I found out when we tried to take NICE to a judicial review, we don't have any legal standing in Scotland. So we can't challenge the NICE guidance. So the only way that we can get guidance that is implementable and challengeable in Scotland is through SIGN. And we also have SMC. And they are more than happy and more than willing to engage with us on looking to review cannabis-based medicine guidance. We just need the team to do it. And I'm suggesting that we get two teams together. One team which is to look at developing the evidence base for pain, cancer, MS, nausea and eczema, which are the, um, the conditions that NICE also cover too. So, you know, we're kind of covering our backs, we're playing the game, you know, but what, what we're going to do is we have an opportunity in Scotland. Scotland has what's called a realistic medicine policy. It's implemented by the Scottish government. It's this idea that there's a dialogue between the patient and the practitioner and that any form of medicine is given with this dialogue. And the idea is it widens up the remit of evidence. We can use a wider range of evidence, including the voice of users when they make that decision. So it's decision. So there's a real major opportunity. The second one is for SMC. So, so sign deal with conditions and they make recommendations for prescribing on conditions. SMC deals specifically with um, drugs. We really want to get um, bedrolite cannabis um, as a option for Scottish patients on the Scottish NHS formulary. And that is also doable. So really, what it, all it is, is that we need to get a group of people together to once again develop the evidence base or, or you know, gather the evidence base and set up a patient company review. If we get the team together, you're talking two to three years, we could have cannabis-based medicine prescribable for pain, cancer, MS, nausea, and eczema, because there's a lot of evidence to support cannabis on those, um, on those conditions. And we could potentially have bedrolite for treatment-resistant epilepsy for children in Scotland. They're doable. The other avenue is if we want to start looking at, so we can't change the law, but we can play with the law. Because the law is creative. And a little known fact that the majority of um, cannabis offences can be dealt with, with by a fine rather than uh, um, conviction. And indeed in Scotland at the moment, all cannabis possessions 
are allegedly dealt with by a fine. But one fundamental aspect that just blew my brain when I came across this statistic is that when you look at the statistics for cannabis possession, the majority of people getting arrested for cannabis possession are young men between the ages of 18 and 24 years old, either in parks or in someone's house. And, of course, to top it off, it's the majority is in areas of lower deprivation or lower socioeconomic development. You know, so we're dealing with a stigmatization of a group of people in society, a targeting of a group of people in society. The way to deal with the legal side of it is a Lord Advocate's reference. And the Lord Advocate needs to be convinced that in Scotland, it is not in the public interest to police the cultivation or possession of cannabis. And once again, that's totally doable. You know, you've got a human rights argument, you've got a social justice argument, you've got, a, you know, you've got a, an equity argument, you've got all sorts of arguments. We just need to get the papers together and the team together to present it. I've already had discussions with three of those people and they agree. So basically, you develop a guideline development group, that would be us, you know, in collaboration with um, sign experts. You then do systematic literature reviews, formation and grading of recommendations, consultation with user groups and peer review by people, not only just um, ex um, academic researchers, but also by patients as well. So the whole process within Scotland is very geared towards a, a developed um, collaboration between the patient and the GP, or sorry, the consultants and the, the guidance. Publication, dissemination and review. And I'm going to blow these candles out at the end of the show. I want us to do a wee meditation again, just to close the event off. If you could all close your eyes and take a deep, deep breath. And I want you to breathe into your solar plexus. Breathe really deeply into your solar plexus. And as you're doing that, Take the energy that you've felt, the feelings from the conversations that you've had, the ideas that have popped into your head, the knowledge that you've exchanged, the dream of what you want the future to look like. And have it in your belly. Have it in your belly as a burning, burning, sort of, well, not burning, but, you know, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Oh, well, you know, it's all part of the process. So, yeah, anyway, laughter aside, but that's good. It's the energy. It's the, fuck, it's the energy. So get it in your belly. And I want you to just really focus on that and imagine that it's going to manifest. This is how we manifest stuff. Everything is a potential. Everything is here in this moment now. And the story has not been written. We're going to write that story. And we're going to write it with social justice, equity, human rights, community and communication.